first talk of the session will be given by Patrick Chapman. The floor is yours. And Patrick is going to talk about interleaving static analysis with uh, LLMs. Hello? Okay. All right. Yeah. So thanks for that introduction. So at a high level, at a high level, the, the very basic question that we're trying to answer today is can the introduction of LLM prompting lead to, <coughs> lead to more learned program facts? And so, uh, more specifically, in our case, can a static analyzer be interleaved with LLM prompting? And so, can program facts learned via an LLM assist a static analyzer? And can the program facts learned via a static analyzer assist an LLM? So, by static analysis, we're referring to those analyzers that are typically uh, used in bug finding applications, where you give some source code you iterate over some number of program points, of course, you run your analysis, you update your program facts repeatedly, and then, of course, you have your final set of learned program facts, which can include things such as types, error specifications, and null pointers, which can then be fed to like bug checkers to find violations related to these uh, program facts. So, by LLMs, I'm sure we're all aware of them and uh, varying opinions on them but they're just large language models where they're given some input and then they're trying to predict the output, the next sequence of characters. So given this natural language prompt from the Iliad, it outputs a remainder of a quote. And of course, it also extends to programming languages now. So given a, a Fibonacci function signature, uh, it outputs an implementation. So. More specifically, a lot of the actual things that people care about with LLMs are what do you provide a prompt in order to generate useful output for it from an LLM? So what is, what is the high level? What do these prompts typically look like? So in, I guess here's a very high level example with program analysis. So you give it some problem description and you can include background knowledge. So maybe various definitions that could be useful. You also can include question and answer examples to the LLM to guide the output. And this example would be a single shot where multiple would be considered few shot. But you can also include natural language explanations called chain of thought explanations in order to hope that you can guide the LLM to more uh, usable um, uh, results. And so of course, then you actually have your main question of interest which the LLM will attempt to answer. So for interleaving, um, what we do by how we interleave program analysis or sorry, static analysis in LLM prompting is so this unknown in this case we'll get well I'll demonstrate an actual example of this, but at some point if you come to an unknown you don't learn anything uh, useful, you instead just prompt the LLM to, of course, for that information and you update your program facts and then you repeat iteratively over those program points and continue running the analysis. So specifically, I'll talk about how we can apply our approach to a static analysis uh, for error specification inference. So this deals with error handling in C since C does not use exception handling. Uh, a lot of times, m many systems uh, or many programs use the return code idiom, which is where uh, specific values are returned on error. And so error specifications are just the function and its values returned on error. And so of course, how can you know what these are without manual inspection, S static program analysis, more specifically error specification inference? So 
specifically, we use the Easy Static Analyzer, which uses abstract in interpretation. So, of course, it just abstracts the return values, like on the sign domain, like a sign lattice, um, where the bottom indicates unknown in this uh, instance, the top indicates all values, and the empty set in this specific uh, an analysis indicates an in, like an infallible function or a function that does not utilize the return code EDM. So what's the actual input to this static analyzer? So it's an initial set of error specifications, status codes, and error-only functions, and the actual output is the set of learned error specifications, which can then be passed to things like bug checkers. So for error specification inference, the workflow looks like, so we iterate over, uh, function starting at the bottom of the call graph, performing a fixed point on each strongly connected component. So at each function, we run an easy, and if the output is bottom, then we prompt the LLM, and we ask it for any error specification. And if it, we can use that uh, learned program fact, then we can update the error specification, and then repeatedly run uh, the rest of the error analysis. So what does the actual prompt consist of that we're passing? So essentially, very, very uh, uh, abstracted version of what we're passing, but essentially I'm just asking it to determine the error specification of a function. And so, of course, I actually have to explain what an error specification is, but also like idiomatic practices, like explaining the return code idiom, the actual abstract domain we use, and the, the status codes and error-only functions relevant to the program under analysis, as those are global. And so we also provide return code um, idiom il illustrative examples that are program agnostic, and we also provide, provide chain of thought explanations like about the return code idiom and explaining them. But we also provide few shot examples of error specifications of called functions already learned during the analysis. And so these come from either easy static analyzer or previously from the LLM already. And the actual question we provide is the just the function definition or in the case of like external library functions or third party functions, we don't actually have the definition of these. Be, um, and so we just provide the name of those and for our few shot examples for those, we actually just provide a global set of error specifications. So of course, with LLMs, there's always the, the issue of hallucination, and we can't make guarantees, of course, but we do attempt to limit some of the imprecision, and we do provide two checks for easy uh, that we can do from learned facts. So like, we can check against success values, obviously, um, known success values that we can calculate during the static analysis. But we also check against the known return range. So if, of course, if the LLM provides an error specification outside of the return range, you know that that's not correct. But we also explicitly reprompt the LLM to remove any known success values as the check against the return range uh, isn't perfect. Um, and to rem and also to remove any error value not confident in. And these were just chosen primarily heuristically because they just seem to work. <laughs> and so here's an example from Embed TLS, which is a uh, implementation of SSL and TLS, and it uh, also has some cryptographic algorithms included. So if we look at this left side of the call chain and we look at this leaf node, this is a third party function and if we don't provide it as an initial error specification, easy won't know anything about it, and it returns minus one on error, and this is, becomes an issue later on in the analysis as this net set block function returns that uh, call uh, value. And so in that case, well, why don't we just prompt an LLM, and since we provide the abstract domain and the other background knowledge, uh, in LLM, in this case GPT-4 Turbo, is able to uh, translate that to the abstract domain that we use for easy, and then we can update the program fact 
get it correct, and then ultimately EZ can use that to get the net set block function. So let's take a look on the right side. So in this case, this lower uh, get tag function, EZ does infer correctly, and but however, Easy in this function or easy later on is unable to infer the attribute type value function for whatever reason. It's more of a black box in this case. And but later on in the analysis, it will get the get name function wrong again, like like the last example because it returns the uh, re uh, the function called return value. So, like I said, whenever it's bottom, um, we're going to attempt to pass the function definition to the LLM. So we'll also demonstrate why they're just not perfect by themselves. So let's say that we don't pass that get tag function that Easy already learned. So the LLM thinks that it's not zero, which if you look at the code, you can understand why it might think that. But that's actually incorrect because it doesn't return positive values on error. Um, and of course, that can affect later on in the analysis. And so and it, it understands that the error code is negative. However, a negative plus a, a positive or a negative, it, it ends up just being top element, which is incorrect. So how about if we, of course, add that um, the, uh, the learned error specification from easy? Well, we see that um, the LLM actually is able to understand that a negative plus a negative is still a negative, and that the error specification here is less than zero. So as we can see here, the easy is able to help the LLM, and then the LLM is able to help easy on this part of the call chain. So for our actual like research questions that we want to actually ask is, so what's the baseline performance of easy? So how is the static analyzer doing by itself? And then what is the actual effect of interleaving? So what is the precision recall in F1 for our approach compared to the baseline? And also to note that error specifications much ma match exactly. So for instance, less than zero is not correct for an error specification that's less, that's, uh, less than or equal to zero, even though it is a, a subset. So for experimental setup, we selected Okay, hello? Okay. So, right, so for our selected LLM, uh, we used GPT-4 Turbo at the time, and uh, we selected six benchmarks um, that you see on the left. And then for the actual initial uh, domain knowledge that's input to the static analyzer is demonstrated on the right-hand side of that table. So for the baseline of easy, uh, of course, higher is better, but the six benchmarks are listed uh, at the bottom. And so the left, of course, uh, the left bar is the precision, middle bar is recall, right bar is F1. And the precision ranges from just under 65 to 97 for Zlib, where the recall is down to 10.3 for Pigeon which also has the highest number of third-party functions. So these can't be statically analyzed by easy. And also embed TLS has the highest. And of course, the F1 ranges from 18.4 to 89.5. So 
our approach uh, improves the recall over ba uh, the baseline. So for the increase of the left is the easy and the right is our interleaved approach. So as you can see here, with pigeon being our lowest, uh, or sorry, highest third party percentage, we see a quite a decent increase there. But we also see an increase in net data, which does have a lower percentage, but still has a good mix. But we do also see a slight decrease in precision, of course, where the pink um, bar on the right is the delta. So these are the uniquely learned error specifications from our approach um, over the static analyzer. So as you can see here, the largest drop-off is within uh, Apache. And, um, but we also do see instances where we do improve, like in net data where we had a relatively low precision to begin with. But more importantly, um, we increased the F1, so the harmonic mean between precision and recall. Uh, we see, of course, the biggest increases being in net data and pigeon again. But also in uh, HTTPD, even though we did lose precision, our F1 increased quite significantly. So in conclusion, we've presented an approach for interleaving static analysis and all prompting. And we've demonstrated that facts learned via one another can assist one another. We've also demonstrated that our approach can enable us to learn more error specifications, where we increased our average recall from 52 to 77.8, um, increase in F1 from 0.61 to 0.8, and then we maintain like relatively similar precision with a drop off um, from 86.6 .6 to 85. And thanks. Um, and of course, our uh, GitHub for this tool. I still have to merge something to master, uh, but that is the link for our uh, tool. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, try. Are there any questions? Thank you. Very nice. Uh, yeah. So I'm wondering if you have some LLM hallucinations and to take them into your analysis, would you recognize that later on during the analysis? So, I mean, I would say the most, the most common like problem that I've seen is the, the LLM will provide a chain of thought explanation that clearly and successfully distinguishes error values and success values but the error specification is the combination. And that's just not right, and it, it's annoying. And so, like, I, we have those success value checks, and, like, telling it to remove the success value eliminates a lot of that. Um, and then also the return range can help with some of that, too, uh, if it's just wrong on the success values, like, it, out of the return range or whatever. Um, it, does that kind of answer? I'm not sure. I, I was wondering, so basically you take those results into your analysis for the next round, right? Yes. Yeah. So would you see in the next round that something is, is fishy here? Uh, no. So like we do, we do that, like um, we do those checks beforehand before we update and then we attempt to update and then we just continue on in the analysis. Okay. Are there, okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, I have a following question about uh, since you queried the LLM on the fly, so have you uh, checked the performance of this analyze since yeah. you, you, if you interact with LLM and uh, especially GPT-4 is not a very, f uh, yeah. Yeah, very well, fast. especially, yeah, because this is over the network, right, because it's GPT which does slow it down. Um, we've done some, uh, so for instance, our longest, our longest running just on the static analyzer was like approximately seven minutes 
just from the static analyzer, but introducing GPT-4 um, and of course the request with those was closer to 30 minutes. So it does, yeah, incre increase the time quite a bit. Um, we have been trying to do some using the offline models like um, Code Llama and you know all the other ones. And uh, the only issue is like those did not perform as well. Um, and like we were having some issues with the models in general, but like if we ignored that, they did run faster, like closer to 10 minutes, like seven to 10. If that makes sense. So, yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, and if I can add to this, ignoring the execution times, in general, more or less a metric on how many of these interleavings you need to uh, perform between the NLM and the EZ before reaching the final results that you can no longer update, if you can give a metric on that. Do you mean like um, like for one function or just like throughout the entire? No, throughout the, the entire analysis, a, a metric. Is, is the LM query like thousands of times for a single analysis or is it just a couple of interactions? So if, if the benchmark is like on the scale of like thousands of functions, we could see like hundreds of queries to the LLM. And like a lot of times the LLM might not produce anything useful. So, yeah. Okay. Last question. Just in this case, when it does not produce anything useful, mm -hmm. how do you find out and what do you do? Well, sometimes it just does, like, won't even output an error specification. But also, we also include, like, LLMs can, may generate a, uh, non-parsable output for our instances, and we considered that to also be unknown. And so if it's unknown, we just continue on the analysis as we would normally, just iterating to the next function. So yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And uh, I would prefer to not use anthropomorphic terms to talk about the, pred uh, the token predictor. Better to say that they are in predict something than it reasons about it. Okay, so thank you, Patrick. Yeah.